Central America problem with the Bay of Pigs <laughs> that uh, we were fortunate to be involved in a good program. They are such an incredible, unique people. I don't, I don't think even ourselves, even within the agency, and perhaps not even within our own group, do we realize just how incredibly unique they are. They still believe their religion. Oh yeah, but they're, they're. I've never met any people like them. I never will. <laughs> Undeng Although basically as a Buddhist uh, uh, believe the if motivation is good and the goal is good, uh, then method uh, even if the apparently violent kind is is permissible, could be possible. But then the in our situation, in our case, uh, the whether is it, the, uh, it is is it, uh, practical or not, uh, that's the I think big question.
They'd start sending their messages. And what they're asking? They're asking arms. And I don't have arms. But then I introduced what you call Americans to the direct foot contact with the Tibetans. And then come in this what you call so called American participating, training, and recruiting, and sending the Tibetans to the United States for training and this and that. Started like that way. We are united in detesting communist slavery. We know that the cost of freedom is high but we are determined to preserve our freedom no matter what the cost. There was this whole sense that you know, the Cold War had come to Asia and that the fear that, which had concentrated obviously primarily on Europe prior to that time, now was this idea that communism was monolithic, communism was working together, that the aggression had to be stopped someplace and that wherever you could do something to stop the Chinese, it had to be done. I was in uh, Saipan in uh, early 57 when uh, we got the cable from headquarters uh, from Washington which said that indeed uh, there was going to be a Tibetan uh, group coming to Saipan for training without too much more information other than that they wanted to cross the board training and uh, that the people in the group were supposed to be able to communicate uh, once they went back into Tibet, which meant, of course, clandestine radio. Mac at the G, Mac at the Mammon of Tinder, do Mac at the Sholo to Vacora Machacon, you would do none. And a cool manzola, Sata Lagure, Bound Taya Lagure, Major Taya Lagure, and a Bound Shaya to the Kanga Lagure, Handy Gurner, you've done Lagure, Tajaya Paya, the J, Kanga, the Mac Consoc Gurti Lagure, Sama Lunga Consore. And it does love down the Chatan to the Kangaya, they are all good to Caradesa. Pachi, one at Toku Chenek, and Manzamas on a Taraz, Korangi, duties or two, the Jimambe, get him, Pento Yuyang, she had to pay a whole lot. And then Manzua Korana Gaboy, Chetang, and Major Tanda with the Kambe Chetanda, we are a Korana. Somebody This is where it came. Yeah, you could have heard the cheers from one end to the other when that first message arrived in that the guys had arrived and they were safe. Well, that was indeed a, a time for celebration. And uh, it was, you know, it's a pretty incredible achievement to think of. Here, here you are, what, 15,000 miles away, message going out, guys sitting over there with a hand crank generator spinning this stuff out. We knew the answer, the, getting the answers to our questions right away.
whole area here is Campeo, this whole area up and down the valley here. That's the area in which we trained the, the Tibetans. We thought that the conditions up at Camp Pale uh, somewhat duplicated uh, the conditions in Tibet. Mountainous terrain, the temperatures, and the, and the climates. The Tibetans were brought up here in buses, and they were, they were trekked into this area here, which was all cordoned off, this from mountain to mountain. That was patrolled by military police. The training area consisted of a series of Quonset huts in which the men lived, and we had a recreational area where we were uh, able to give them some recreation, and we had classrooms and so on and so forth. And of course, in connection with the training, uh, we would uh, make overnight trips up into the mountains to teach them hit-and-run type tactics, guerrilla type tactics, if you will. I'm <laughs> It was unique in the sense we were working directly with people who believed very much in their own cause. And that, I think, gave it a rather unique quality. It was the thing that certainly had caused the tremendous rapport. And I, don't, I just got hooked on these people. They were great. And the, then I started learning about their cause. And uh, it seemed to be something that I would like to lend myself to and could certainly do with wholeheartedly. We, we had this group and we trained them and the people who did the training, of course, uh, f fell in love with them. From an emotional point of view, quite apart from national interest and pragmatic uh, situation, all that, we felt so strongly about the Tibetans themselves and the Tibetan cause that if we could roll the clock back to the time when they were truly independent, we, we'd love to do that. During the training period, we learned that you know, the objective of training was to gain our independence for the struggle for Tibet. The idea was, all of us, was gradually go back to Tibet down there and organize the resistance movement, organize way, not in our, so that we can, you know, pressurize the Chinese gradually, force them to leave our country. That was the main objective. In our games room, we had a picture of Eisenhower, signed by Eisenhower to my fellow Tibetan friends from Eisenhower. So we know that. So we <laughs> during Eisenhower's period. So it was, uh, we thought it's, you know, even from the Eisenhower himself is giving us the support. I think basically the whole idea was to keep the Chinese occupied somehow, uh, keep them annoyed, keep them disturbed. Nobody wanted to go to war over Tibet. Uh, that's pretty clear. We didn't go to war over Korea, and we didn't go to war over Indochina. We weren't going to go to war over Tibet. And so it was a nuisance operation, basically nothing more. And I would think that from the American point of view, it wasn't going to cost us very much, <clears throat> either money or manpower. Anyway, it wasn't our manpower involved. It was the Tibetan manpower. And we would be willing to help the Tibetans become a running sore and a nuisance to the Chinese. The anecdote I like to tell about Alan Dulles was the fact that they asked me to go up to the director's office and brief him on what was going on in Tibet. He says, now, where is Tibet? <laughs> we stand up on a leather couch in his office, and he has a National Geographic world map up there. 
and he's pointing to Hungary, and he thinks, is that <laughs> Tibet? I said, no, sir, it's over here where the Himalayas. Oh, close to and, uh, That's really close. It <laughs> Tindijigana, About every 24 hours, they would send us a message giving us their location, and we were able to take that material and then feed it into the uh, intelligence bulletins that were kept the senior officials in the government informed as to the location, the actual location of the Dalai Lama on his escape. And so this had gone on for better part of a week. <laughs> Uh And it was a Saturday night, and I got a call from the office that a message had come in, which was unusual. The Dalai Lama was asking for asylum. Well, this was a critical piece of information, and it had to be handled very quickly. And so I took that message and went down to my office, and it was after midnight at that time, and I called my boss and told him what it was, and he said, well, go ahead and send a message to... India and to Delhi and uh, let them proceed with what they can do. So I did that and it, it, got, it was on the wire in less than an hour and I came home and about 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning I got a message that the answer was back and that um, Mr. Nehru had approved the asylum. The Dalai Lama's decision to flee was his. He didn't team up with any of the people that we knew until two or three days uh, en route, where one of the teams that had been dropped in before, one of the radio teams, then joined the uh, escape party and then were able to keep the American government informed as uh, he went along and the, his progress. So in that sense, it was another intelligence coup on the part of the uh, minor what I mean, we knew something the rest of the world didn't.
We were getting messages to the effect that we are as determined as ever to resist, but we cannot do it without significant inputs of troops and weapons. And basically, they wanted they wanted us, I suppose, to come to their aid with an army. Uh, ideally, that was never in the in the cards, and I think. Uh, their disappointment was uh, was shared, obviously, by by us simply because uh, we knew it wasn't possible, and we understood at the same time that that was their last hope. That's what they thought was their last hope of uh, becoming uh, free of the Chinese. <laughs> Nia uh, we knew from overflight information that monitoring Chinese air flights that they had uh, they had discovered Pembar. And the sad, uh, the sad, sad story is that very few chose to go and leave and understandably so, and indeed uh, that group uh, came under merciless attack by reinforcements of Chinese came in with long-range artillery, they came in with aircraft, they bombed, and they captured uh, thousands, or uh, I think the more accurate statement is that they, uh, they killed thousands and thousands and thousands and captured maybe a, a few hundred. Then, <laughs> 
Ma jebe tobla ta de mi je ta patu ki je mi tra ngato kota shos. Kota shos. Kota shos. Ma ton takko swas kota ya. Kunjo ta. Takko swas. Chunto kon durung ba tizu chan yo. Chunto kon so so kota ta ta sme te ji ursa. Sa. Pasu ti ari ten ti ki se pa. Sa ta bo ma so ne ji pa. Se bo ti ari ya. Mun ne ti be ki ki Minuta che re mo to che mune ta ne ti ti be ke ti ti ma re sa ta ta bo che bo che yo ta Inde je che tu be so le tu ta aro ndo lo ni ge ko ra ni ya le ke men ti sian ji tu ta tu wa Ta ni ga cha za ta ba tu ge xie ri che de mu kon tu ni ka ga chi xian za ta se bo cha ta ti men ti ke na de ni ha de yo ta ge na mi zo ni sa lo yo ma ta sad part of that is uh, no one had an accurate read on Tibet in those early years. You know, there was a golden opportunity there at one time, and I honestly believe that it would have changed, uh, could have changed considerably. But the Chinese did the smartest thing when they first came in. The first thing they did was build the roads. Build the roads. What was that for? Not for anything except be able to get the troops in there. It was we never expected they were going to come in in the numbers that they did. And that, uh, that was a poor reading on, uh, I don't know, our part, somebody else's oh, part. Our intelligence was yeah. not that good. It was almost non-existent. The idea was it was going to be kept a secret operation too. In many ways it was, that was foolhardy. It's hard to keep a secret in India. It's hard to keep a secret among anybody. The word got out and instead of the lovely controlled movement of two or three hundred people, a couple thousand moved over there and suddenly moved over into Mustang and we were confronted with a ready-made base and a ready-made problem. Rono se hono ngo se gagoro wa gato ne de gaji da duji ne de duji de khuchas rono se tane penesu kochir lonson de la lenta kusa ne ne suna na kashi chilnor de e papi ne pene chanjo singi mundo ne se ne ngo se pento mars ne sil de chaje de gurs jase no ho jagale bagur o mata don ya no mata on rogur When someone called ten charge to men, Hosu Chiji, Nini, said, Then what's change of this? Well, didn't they call a letter to Mazos? Gaduchi Tom for your mamma. Connor Roma won't wear a chess on some good gadu.
In Hmong the convoy's uh, baggage, in effect, they found some very fascinating Chinese government documents, which the Tibetan resistance brought out and gave to our people, and we made it available to the U.S. intelligence community, and they were absolutely gone, you know, berserk, really, with this wonderful material, because it's one of the few times we had some real, honest-to-goodness Chinese government official documents, and they weren't uh, made up for us or anything like that. They weren't forgeries. And it showed that the Chinese communists were having trouble with their Great Leap Forward, and was having trouble with their with other parts of China, not just in Tibet. And uh, it gave a very good insight as to what was going on inside of China. For the first time, we had some real good, hard evidence. The Tibetan document raid was one of the greatest intelligence halls in the history of the agency. Here was sort of, in a way, <clears throat> uh, well, I, it's a ter you, you don't evaluate human lives in terms of return, but here was an actual intel a product of these operations that could be seen on a demonstrable one, <clears throat> a benefit to the U.S. government. So that was of great help as far as getting or maintaining support for these kind of operations. カリスナタチョトマミプルチャトヨマネス。天蔵マチャナリツイコドザメタグレス。ディザネマチスタチョトネズトコルス。イネガトティノニヤヨマレ。カツイコカブラナリパトギオレ。タコトナトチキメスマ
it was a different era. I think they pulled out a Mustang because of basically the operational utility was no longer there. It was pulling out of support for His Holiness, and then it was you know we were starting a rapprochement with China, and it was a new, if not made at direct Chinese request. It was a the U.S. relations with Tibet were something that would would, would be certainly considered by that time to be somewhat of an impediment to relations, to the close relationship that uh, the government was trying to uh, initiate with Beijing. The CIA told me, and they, the Chinese government made a condition to in, enable for United States to establish diplomatic relations with China. They made a condition, two conditions. One, United States must cut off their diplomatic relationship with Republic of China, Taiwan. Second, United States must cut off all the connections and all assistance for the Tibetans, including Master. But then, politics are politics. You never know. Sooner or later, they're going to betray you. Because Americans are giving me verbal assurances saying if the Dalai Lama comes to India, they will support for India's a Tibetan independence until Tibet regain independence. <laughs> Operations like this can't last forever. Uh, you either achieve your objective or you don't. And if you don't, you've got to cut it and, keep, and uh, you know, make a clean cut and walk away. Um, you might be able to, as you leave, uh, give what one, somebody called a surge funding. You give an extra couple of the year's worth of funds and say, okay, here, we have to leave you. Uh, goodbye, thank you for the, all you've done for us, and, uh, but this will keep you going for a little bit and, and you know, find some other sources. When all of a sudden the American government or CIA stopped our you know, program all of a sudden, then we felt a little bit, we've been deceived. We've been, you know, this is what I felt also. And many of my colleagues, you know, in, in Mustang felt. There was no, because I think our usefulness, we felt our usefulness to the CIA has finished, which means they were, they were only thinking for a short term, for their own personal gain, not for the long-term interest of the Tibetan people as such. I don't know, these covert action operations in the U.S. government's interest in things is amazingly short on oh, the right. lifespan of these things. Well, it's dependent on which administration, too. Well, but you, this one went through several. Yeah. Times. There were, never was a really partisan issue on Tibet. But as, uh, I guess, a U.S. employee uh, that still smarts that we pulled out when, in the manner we did in the, uh, the same old way, granted, in many, uh, many other operations, we... Uh, we did it even less gracefully and more abruptly, which... Uh, Remember, it, Beirut, we uh, walk away from it, so it's an old, a car wreck. Well, we, can, we can count them one after one after yeah, one after one. Look at the current one with the Kurds, as far as that move. I was told uh, they decide if Nepalese uh, 
officials uh, come to their place and uh, take arms. Then they decide to fight. Uh, so that's very serious. There, you see, they, I think the few hundred Tibetan can stop. There's some Nepalese, you see, uh, people there for a few months. But what use? And then several thousand Tibetan in Nepal, they will suffer. So therefore, there's no other alternative except my direct sort of involvement. Then I said the message. <laughs> ジャンルタネ、まず聞いて、とんだろう、風邪、ドゥルシ、ドゥルシ、まだ、ドゥルメ、ドゥルメ。てに、スンパン、もし、タパゴ、コンドロゴ。あ、スンパン、人はどうで
Unfortunately, our history as a government has more sad stories and sad endings than it does have good stories with good endings. Generally speaking, I think the agency uh, looks at Tibet as having been one of the best operations that the agency has run. Well, that's fine. That's very complimentary. But however, look at the final results. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's a very sad commentary. If we look at what we did to Tibet as about the best that we could do, then I say that we have failed miserably. <laughs> 